Cup League round of 32. Spurs uh, booked their place in the round of 16. 4 0 winners at home to Wolfsburg. Got a busy football show for you later on. Tim Vickery, always a welcome guest, will be talking to us about the new Pele documentary, which is available on Netflix. If you've seen it, fire in any thoughts. 53106. You'll get us at Off the Ball on Twitter. But first, we are talking Celtic. We have with us Paul John Dykes, author and host of a Celtic State of Mind podcast. Paul John, you're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me on. It's an absolute pleasure. What has been the Celtic State of Mind all year? Miserable, horrified, disgusted, angry? Nothing good, I suspect. Uh, all of the above and a little bit more as well. We were entering a, a season where we felt that history would be made and all season, month on month, uh, has been a catastrophe, hmm. followed by an even bigger catastrophe. So today's news, obviously, is basically the final part of that um, sorry, sorry affair. We feel hmm. it was um, something that should have happened a while ago. And Paul John, on your podcast or in various Celtic forums or however you could all communicate in this uh, pandemic situation, were there inklings or were there worries as the season was beginning that this, uh, you know, 10 in a row season was going to go awry? Or was everybody feeling pretty OK about things? I think the majority of people were feeling fairly confident without being too bullish or complacent about it. I mean, if you go further back, you know, the Green Brigade um, had unleashed various banners at the ground to warn the board not to fall asleep at the wheel. And at that time, you know, I, I feel that that feeling was uh, part of a minor minority group. But as the season went on, more and more people uh, began to look back on the way that we had been recruiting players, the way that we had allowed Brennan Rodgers to leave the club, and even Neil Lennon's appointment. You know, but again, this is all with hindsight. You go back to the summer after what looked like a very positive transfer window and many, many Celtic fans, I feel, were rightfully confident going into this season. OK, so it's a double whammy. You didn't even see this thing coming. We, we didn't. And, and again, we always expect the board to see it coming. We expect the powers at the club to see it coming. But as fans, you know, we were just trying to stabilise ourselves, knowing that for part of the season, we felt we wouldn't be in the stadium. We didn't realise it would be for the entire season. But, um, you know, very quickly, though, very quickly indeed, it, it became clear that something was just not right at Celtic Park way back in August. Mm. Um, and, you know, after every big defeat, uh, a group of fans like someone, myself, a Celtic State of Mind, other podcast, would come out and speak about a change being needed. Some people thought that was knee jerk. But as the season went on, more and more people started feeling the same. Has there been a consistency to the performances? And But when I say a consistency, consistency to the performances, I mean what's wrong with them? Like, is there just a fairly galling issue for Celtic on the field or is it a whole uh, spectrum of different things going wrong at different times? Well, there definitely is a spectrum of issues all around the club. But uh, as fans watching on the park, the team playing with absolutely no tempo, no shape, no imagination, and strangely for Celtic, a lack of fitness. Right. A huge a huge amount of goals that we've conceded this season have been after the 70th minute, and that's unusual for Celtic. So you look at the squads, we kept all the star players. We didn't sell anyone off in the summer. We brought in six new players. We felt we were strengthening the squad. Of course, Shane Duffy was one of those players. But, you know, it didn't click, and it hasn't clicked all season. You could go right back to the Ferenc Varos game in the Champions League, mm. the first game against Rangers when we were well beaten. We didn't even have a shot at goal that day. And that was early in the season. And it just got, it went from bad to worse. Which brings us to Neil Lennon then. So defeat to Ross County on Sunday left them 18 points behind Rangers and uh, Lennon has announced his resignation. How culpable is he in all of this, do you feel? Hugely. I mean, it is a joint responsibility, and we keep saying this. There's an issue around recruitment, uh, and interestingly enough, Brendan Rodgers came out today and spoke about the new manager will require autonomy when it comes to selecting his staff and his players. Right. I, I don't think Neil Lennon's had that. He didn't assemble, assemble his own coaching staff, and he didn't get his first choice 
of player. So we know that he was interested in Fraser Foster. We lost out. He wanted Ivan Tony. We lost out on him as well. We brought in Barkas and Ayeti for £10 million worth of new signings, and they haven't worked out. So Neil Lennon has to work with what he's got. I mean, he's got a talented squad. This is a frustration. Eduard, Christie, McGregor, uh, Ayer at the back, Julien before he got injured. We've got a talented squad. Uh, he, he failed to play David Turnbull right through to the, the latter end of 2020. Turnbull's come in and been an absolute revelation. Mm. So the question, the question would be, why didn't we play him earlier? We needed his creativity. And that was down to Lennon. When I think of Brennan Rodgers, I mean, and increasingly it's easy to do so given how things are going at Leicester, you think of a tactically astute coach, forward thinking, a well-drilled outfit. When I think of Lennon, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking here in generalities and perception, but I would see more of an old school coach, you know, of the uh, Martin O'Neill school of look, you're all players, go out there and do it, figure it out yourselves, you know, be men out there and maybe uh, in the modern era, that's less and less effective. So is that a fair observation of Lennon? I mean, you're watching them week in, week out. Would that be a complaint of Lennon's management? 100%. Okay. And, and we could actually look at the first tenure under Neil Lennon compared to this one. Someone on the podcast last week said he's an analogue manager in a digital football world. And I think that is the way to describe Neil Lennon. So first time round, we had a player up front called Anthony Stokes, you'll be aware of Tony Stokes. Now, if Neil Lennon shouts and screams at Anthony Stokes in the dressing room, he'll get a response from him, and he often did. If he tries that with Odson Edouard straight out of the PSG Academy, Odson Edouard will down tools and won't try a leg, and that's exactly what's happened. Some of his ex-players, so Marvin Bartley at Hibs, Kelvin Wilson and Joe Ledley at Celtic, have all recently come out and said, that Neil Lennon did not place too much emphasis on tactics. And in 2020-21, that is suicide because yeah. we've got uh, a management team, albeit an inexperienced team uh, at Rangers, who are led by Stephen Gerrard, but we have Michael Beale and Gary McAllister in there as well. And they figured out very quickly how to play Celtic. And that was key. Which brings us to his replacement, I suppose. John Kennedy will take charge of the team for now. Is he likely to have any chance of getting the job on a full-time basis? I think we're in a similar situation uh, than we were back in 2010 when Neil Lennon got the job first time round. He's got eight games. I think it was nine back uh, in Neil's time. So John Kennedy's got eight games. He's a highly rated coach. He's worked under Ronnie Dyler, Brendan Rodgers and Neil Lennon. But Celtic fans want a wholesale change. So when Neil Lennon stepped down today and it was announced this morning that he had resigned, Celtic fans wanted the entire coaching staff to follow him. Because if, if you think about it, you know, John Kennedy and Gavin Strachan are working with those players day to day on the, on the training grounds. Uh, obviously, Neil Lennon's a manager. He picks the team. He gives the team talk. He makes the decisions at the side of the park. But John Kennedy is also culpable. Mm. So... I think even though he is one of the front runners when it comes down to the odds of replacing Neil Lennon permanently, it would not be a popular decision. Yeah. So even if they were to grind out, you know, seven one nil wins and a decent result and a draw, and that, you know, on the face of it is a decent effort across nine games, it mightn't bode so well for the future in reality. I don't think so. And you know, I might be doing an injustice to John Kennedy. He's been at the club, believe it or not for 30 years. He's only 37. He's only 37 years of age. Right. And, you know, Damien Duff said upon his departure from Celtic that he rated John Kennedy as one of the best coaches he had ever worked with. So that's high praise indeed. Mm. But as I say, it's guilty by association. He's been part of this downfall, this, this campaign. And I, I hope that it's only a temporary measure to have John Kennedy in place. The names I'm seeing bandied about include Eddie Howe, Rafa Benitez, I've seen Roberto Martin as his name. Haven't seen Roy Keane's name, actually. I would have thought that's an easy uh, headline even. You know, you would just think, well, let's just throw Roy Keane's name on a, on, a, on a headline and we'll get lots of clicks or we'll uh, sell a few papers. I haven't seen Keane's name mentioned in relation to the job. I mean, he would be perceived as also of the Martin O'Neill era for obvious reasons. He would. I think recently uh, former midfielder Stylian Petrov did 
give Roy Keane a shout out. Again, I can see how that's kind of uh, received on the podcast because we've got a live and interactive section of that. And again, you know, maybe surprising to some, it wouldn't be a popular choice. People do look at Roy Keane in the same kind of mould as Martin O'Neill. He's obviously worked with him at various in various jobs. But again, if you look at Keane's managerial record, he's only managed 151 games. And I think only one season was in the top flight in England. So, you know, Celtic fans are looking at, you know, managers like Eddie Howe, Rafa Benitez has been mentioned, and as have Roberto Martinez uh, yeah. and Sean, Sean Maloney. Now, these, these are top-end managers, and, you know, they're also, I'm sure, going to be chased by some of the clubs down south. So what I will say is whatever the appointment is will indicate to the Celtic support the level of ambition of the new board and the, the CEO who's coming in in the summer. What's the financial situation at the club? Well, we, we recently announced our half-term results, um, our interim results, and Celtic had lost uh, a great sum of money. Uh, you know, we were basically £12 million down, uh, a loss is £6 million. So we are stable in terms of Scottish football. I mean, the clubs... Uh, throughout the, the game are going to be in a dire, dire situation. Celtic uh, were in a good position before we went into the pandemic. 57,000 uh, fans bought season tickets knowing we wouldn't be there um, wow. throughout the season. So we will survive this, uh, but we will have to look at the recruitment because we can't afford to be throwing £5 million at Greek goalkeepers who don't play. Yeah. <laughs> so you say Celtic sold... Did you say 57,000 season tickets at the start of this yeah, season? We did, yeah, 57. We were able to sell a few thousand more uh, in the knowledge that we wouldn't actually be in the ground. So the maximum was 57 and we sold out. Um, now, the club are actually going to be asking the season tickets to renew in the coming weeks. We would expect that at some point in March normally. Uh, and I think the announcement today was part of a charm offensive because the club really need to keep the supporters on side. Mm. So uh, certainly a healthy quotient of those 57,000 were in effect just charitable donations to the club from fans. Yeah, they were. And, you know, what we got in return was a virtual season ticket. We got a pass to Celtic TV. Uh, it wasn't great. Um, I was getting text messages uh, if someone was watching it on another broadcaster because they were, they were getting the game live and, you know, we were seven or eight seconds behind. So it's not been a great season, but Celtic fans realised uh, the magnitude of this season, the fact that it was 10 in a row. So you're right, it was really uh, donations, but the club uh, are now being faced with, I'm not going to say a rabid fan base, mm. but uh, questions have been asked, protests have taken place outside the ground already this season. Uh, and I think the departure of Peter Lowell, first and foremost, followed by Neil Lennon, are two ways closer to trying to get the, the fan base back on board. But again, a lot of that's going to hinge on who will be the manager. As for the playing base, I've seen the accusation made that a number of the players down tools. Uh, we, you, you mentioned the striker. I, so ha, that has that happened? Or, and who uh, would that be aimed at? Like how many players, if I was to ask an average Celtic fan, do they reckon of down tools? You know what, that, that comes from comments made by Neil Lennon after we were knocked out of the Champions League. And he came out and said that there are players in that dressing room who don't want to be at the club. So Neil Lennon came out and said that, and I think the reason he did it was to try and get a reaction. I think he was playing mind games. He's always been known as a motivator, but you know this, it backfired. Right. So the types of players you're looking at are Olivier Encham, who's gone out to Marseille on loan, Jeremy Frimpong, who has been transferred uh, to Bayer Leverkusen, uh, Odson Edouard, who is our game changer. He's the man um, who can turn a game on its head. Ryan Christie, who wants to move down south. And finally, Chris Iyer. And out of that bunch of players, the one guy who's never let us down this season has been Chris Iyer. I mean, he's had interest from AC Milan. He's going to go to the very top, but he's not allowed his uh, the disharmony within the dressing room to affect his performances. Mm. In the short term, of course, there is the prospect of Rangers being able to clinch the title at Parkhead on March 21st. I presume you'd all rather avoid that. 
That is <laughs> the worst case scenario. And I remember the last time that happened in actual fact. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's one of these things that I know certainly Rangers fans would look forward to that. Um, but the magnitude again of that, it really is rubbing our nose in it. Uh, and also it's a reminder, it's a stark reminder that, you know, the pendulum of domination has swung back and forth in Glasgow for generations. Uh, we're watching it swing away from Celtic Park uh, in the cruelest possible fashion it would all happen at our own patch. So we hope it doesn't happen. Rangers have not been beaten domestically this season in the league. Uh, they don't actually look as though they will be beaten. So that's something that we won't be looking forward to. Mm. How big a deal has the 10 in a row thing been? It's been massive. It's been all-encompassing. We've been speaking about it since... 2013, 2014, you know, people were selling merchandise this year saying that uh, it's going to be 10 in a row. Had, obviously, we'd been in the grounds, that would have been the chant all season. But you know what? It might have actually been one of the main reasons for us capitulating. We have been so focused on domestic domination that we have been happy to be just one step ahead of the competition. Mm. Um, and across the city... Steven Gerrard has built a unit. He's built a very competent side. Uh, and they all work for the manager. And as I say, they could go throughout the entire league campaign unbeaten. Even if Celtic were at their very best this season, it would be neck and neck. Right, OK. Uh, so Steven Gerrard's doing a very good job. God, 10 years. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a hell of a thing to have to start over again, that 10 in a row. You know this, uh, I remember back in the, the bad old days when Rangers were winning nine titles in a row. Yeah. And I, I never thought in my lifetime that I would see it for Celtic. I never thought I would see Celtic playing in a European final. And I have. I've seen all of these things. I've been there. I was at the games. Um, we've enjoyed a quadruple treble. And it's fine to look back, but we can't rest on our laurels for much longer because, as I say, you know, what happens at Rangers is they win the league. They have an opportunity uh, to access Champions League riches. If that happens, the financial gap will shorten. Mm. Celtic, <clears throat> over the last 10 years, have been way ahead the most, <clears throat> the most uh, rich club in the country. If we ever fell into any kind of trouble, we could probably buy ourselves out of it. Uh, this season, the capitulation this season, has thrown everything um, out, out the window, uh, along with the kitchen sink. So we really need to act quickly, and I think that's why there are real concerns around this appointment. It is a massive appointment. It's as big as the appointment that we made when Martin O'Neill came in as a manager after the John Barnes and Kenny Dalgleish experiment. A final one for you. What of the Shane Duffy situation then? Your read on Duffy and his performances and the treatment he's received. I mean, his confidence is clearly on the floor. Why has it gone so badly wrong for Shane Duffy? He seemed to start OK. You know what? Everybody at Celtic were delighted. The fans were delighted. We were crying out for someone of Shane Duffy's ilk. We needed that experience at the back. And I spoke to a, a pal of mine who's a Brighton fan. And this description kept coming up. He's a no-nonsense defender. Now, Chris Julian and Chris Iyer are ball players. They like to run with the ball. They like to spray passes all over the park. And what we wanted is we wanted someone to come in with the experience of a Shane Duffy. Obviously, the Irish connection. You know, he's captain to Ireland. He comes in. He's a Celtic man. And it's been horrible to watch. It's been absolutely horrible to watch. Uh, he's simply not performed. He's had personal issues. He's had injuries. And, you know, the, the likelihood is he'll go back to Brighton in the summer. But uh, the Celtic fans truly wanted that to work out, and it simply has not worked for all parties concerned. Mm. Yeah, it is a pity. Uh, final one for you, uh, Paul John. Just, uh, it's occurring to me, obviously we don't have fans in the stadium now, so I'm, I'm, you're probably going to have to go back to maybe um, a year ago or whatever. But you talk there about growing up and watching the Soonest era and now into... Uh, the 2000s and so you've you've been around this uh, rivalry with Rangers for a very long time is it as toxic for want of a better word and and hate-filled and sectarian as it's ever been or is or, or has that changed over time I don't think it's any better put it that way I think what's happened is you know both clubs are huge institutions uh, across the world not just in Scotland 
And when, obviously, Rangers were not in the league, Celtic fans enjoyed that. Mm. Now, that's natural. That's football. Uh, but as you've just said there, Celtic against Rangers isn't just your normal football banter. It's not just football crack. It goes deeper than that. And when the uh, situation arose where it, it looked likely that Rangers would actually win the league, um, the big thing for me is the football fans need to enjoy their own success rather than someone else's demise. But in Glasgow, that doesn't work. That doesn't happen. So they are just as enthused about our downfall as they are about their own success. Mm. It hasn't gone away. You would hope that in generations, the hate and the sectarianism and the bigotry would, would ease off a bit. You know, we're living in enlightened times now. And let's just hope that when people come out of the, the end of this pandemic, and we've all had a lot of time to think, you know, we've weighed up what's important in life. It's great to have rivalries. Of course it is. But let's just remember what's important in life. And when we get back into those football stadiums, let's let's remember the hard times we've all been through. Yeah, well, listen, that's a nice note to finish on, hopefully. Paul John Dykes, author and host of Celtic State of Mind, the podcast. Thanks.